are all sitting in on the fourth seminar in our series on advanced transportation technologies. Uh, this uh, course is uh, broadcast uh, and everyone out there in internet land can watch it. Uh, and I'm going to now introduce Kylie Bivens, who's going to give you some uh, background. I know many of you are here every week and know, uh, know exactly what's going to happen, but every week we have some new people show up. So anyway, Kylie's going to tell you a little bit more about uh, the way we operate. As always, uh, this, this seminar is also being streamed as a webinar, and we are streaming this live on YouTube Live. So for our remote audience, welcome. Please be sure to go into your chat box and submit your name, affiliation, and number of viewers so that we can report that information to the USDOT. Um, also, in that same chat box, you will also include your questions, and your questions will be answered at the, uh, towards the end of the seminar. Um, so, and for those of you in the audience, please leave all of your questions to the end. Anyway, uh, I am privileged to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dona Ray Sapp is a senior policy analyst with the Indianapolis, uh, no, Indiana University. Uh, uh, Public Policy Institute, which is at the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis campus. Uh, she is the principal investigator and basically oversees the Institute traffic safety applied research efforts. And on top of that, she oversees uh, the production of all the crash analyses for the uh, state of Indiana. So if there's any questions about uh, crashes in the state of Indiana, she's the go-to person. Uh, anyway, uh, besides that, uh, she works on the safety of vulnerable road users, including pedestrians and bicyclists, and is very much engaged in trying to come up with countermeasures associated with reducing uh, the unreasonably high number of pedestrian and uh, bicycle crashes in the state of Indiana. So without further ado, oh, you have a mic. I do, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thanks, Max, and I wanted to thank the Roadway Safety Institute um, for inviting me to participate in the seminar series. I've actually been able to catch a couple of um, the recent presentations and it's kind of nice to see how uh, things are different or alike, um, depending on, on where you're at. Um, so today, I'm going to kind of walk you through um, what Max had talked about as our traffic safety research uh, partnership and, and just give you a background on that. Um, the Indiana University Public Policy Institute is a, an applied research center. and. We deal with um, a wide variety of public policy issues. Um, my uh, area of expertise and where my work has been focused in re recent years has been in the areas of um, traffic safety, public safety in general, and some criminal justice research efforts. So um, I'm going to walk you through kind of some of the details of how our partnership in the area of traffic safety has evolved over the years. And I'm also going to show you some of our select research findings um, to show you some of the patterns that we, that we see and the trends that we see in different areas um, related to, to uh, motor, motor vehicle crashes in Indiana and how that information has been used to inform policy and program development over the years. Uh, I'm going to close with some of the innovative approaches that um, we've been taking on the um, data analysis and research side um, just to improving accessibility to information and the utilization of the crash data, which is actually just a very rich data set. And um, I think we've kind of only scratched the surface and how that information can be used. So, uh, our, our partnership is um, it's primarily funded through the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute, and that's a state agency in Indiana. Uh, they are responsible for facilitating a statewide um, traffic safety collaboration between uh, state and local agencies and university partners. And uh, it's primarily funded um, 
by NHTSA and um, we try a lot of the work that we do as far as the topics that we cover follow the NHTSA guidelines and the priority areas identified by NHTSA and Federal Highways. Um, so we have a research team. I'm the principal investigator presently. Um, we have a number of professional research staff and faculty members who also have worked on the project over the years. And we work with the Indiana University Department of Biostatistics as our data management partner. Um, so it's, it's a very large project and it's, it's very complicated and so we have a, a lot of um, partners that, that help us make it happen every year. Uh, as far as our external partners, um, those um, organizations that are external to the university, uh, we work, as I mentioned, uh, the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute is our primary partner, but we also work with a number of state and local and even in uh, even federal agencies. Indiana has a governor's council on impaired and dangerous driving and uh, so we often interact with them. Uh, we present information to them as they uh, try to develop um, different approaches to addressing uh, problem areas around the state. Uh, I know uh, there, we, I, I had lunch with Nicole today and I, we talked about the TRCC here in um, Minnesota. So I'm a member of the TRCC or the Traffic Records Coordinating Committee in Indiana and uh, some of the other team members also um, serve on that committee. And we, we meet regularly to uh, talk about different ways to link data sets between agencies and it's actually been a very um, fruitful partnership over the years and we've identified different ways, um, different data sets that different agencies are, um, they're collecting data, but uh, those linkages are not occurring naturally, so we're able to kind of put mechanisms in place to link these data sets together um, to see things that maybe you might not otherwise see. Um, so some of those agencies include the Indiana State Police, and I'll talk a little bit more about their role with the crash data here in a minute, because um, I think it does differ a little bit from um, uh, the kind of the structure um, of who manages the crash data and who owns the crash data. It differs a little bit from Minnesota. Uh, we also work with the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, um, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Health in Indiana. They um, there's an epi epi epidemiology group there that has um, taken quite an interest in um, some of our analyses and have asked us to present um, to a, a variety of groups um, and they are particularly interested in the vulnerable user group um, and I'll talk uh, again I'll talk about that in a little more detail later on. Um, the one of the things that I think is really effective about um, the usage of the crash data and how we kind of continue to see improvements in data collection and usage is the fact that local law enforcement agencies have a very prominent role in this partnership. Um, having those kind of uh, the local agencies that can give you the perspective of maybe a small town sheriff versus a large um, urban police department, we're able to kind of incorporate those things um, a little more effectively whenever we decide to make changes to the crash reporting system. Um, sometimes I think you, you think if you make a small change it's not going to be that big of a deal, but um, if you're not listening to the local partners who say, if you do that it's going to cause all kinds of problems for me, um, then you're going to have big headaches down the road. So uh, we also, there also are a number of nonprofit um, groups that, that work with uh, the uh, state and local agency partners and they play a, a big role in, in um, sometimes identifying the need for maybe a special report that might not be kind of on our regular list of publications but they want us to look at something that they're seeing or they're hearing from their community as a growing problem. So our work is um, I've kind of I've, I think when you see our um, external partners, you can see that we're very interdisciplinary in uh, our work on this project, but also within the university, it's very interdisciplinary in nature. We try to bring in expertise um, from a variety of areas, um, and we found that that helps in 
uh, identifying uh, or interpreting information differently and, and just getting insights from people that may be the regular members of this traffic safety research team who have been looking at the data for 10 years, maybe uh, we, we might not be seeing something. So we've had faculty working on this uh, initiative with um, backgrounds in uh, urban planning, um, public finance, uh, criminal justice. Um, some of that is like uh, specific to policing and law enforcement. Um, we've had uh, faculty that have expertise in spatial analysis um, and that has actually opened up a lot of possibilities um, looking at the data um, down to you know the street level or the point level in a, a given community and I don't think that a lot of that had really been done um, uh, pri prior to some of the things that we've done in maybe the last five or six years. And uh, more recently, we had um, a faculty member who works a lot in the areas of substance abuse in, in the state. And uh, he was able to offer a lot of insights um, because when you're looking at impaired driving, one of the problem areas that we've identified with the crash data is they do do, uh, Indiana does a pretty good job of collecting information on alcohol impaired driving, but we've identified there's a need for improvement um, on the use of other drugs, um, specifically the um, prescribed medications and um, when people are driving under the influence of those types of, uh, of drugs. And there's not good data there, but we are, it, because of um, some of the insights that we've uh, received from this faculty member, we're able to start pushing um, members of this partnership that that's, that that's going to be a target area for future upgrades to the CRASH database that we're going to be able to um, identify ways of improving the collection of that type of information. Um, so the, um, just fairly recently, the Indiana Department of Transportation is um, the agency responsible for developing the Indiana Strategic Highway Safety Plan each year. And fairly recently, they adopted, um, uh, formally adopted the language of the Towards Zero Deaths um, initiative. Um, I think that some of those things were kind of already in place, but they're moving towards, a, I guess, a more um, formal uh, approach to um, to the the priority areas of that of that initiative. So uh, I think our most of the work that we do because NDOT is more of an engineering perspective, and um, most of the work that we do on the research um, that we do on the crash data is really more focused on the enforcement and education portions. So we're kind of more focused on the human behaviors related to crash data and how to impact those. And we work primarily with practitioners in the field that are focused on developing programs and policies that might impact driver behavior, for example. And whenever I show you some of our examples of uh, our data visualizations, we can see very clear patterns of um, uh, drivers of particular age groups and genders that uh, continually exhibit um, the same types of behaviors and crashes. And so uh, the people that we work with are more focused on coming up with ways to get those individuals to change their behaviors to prevent crashes. Uh, so, so what we're doing is we drill down. It's a very complex data set. Um, there's a lot of different levels to it. And, and we're able to kind of drill down and, and really get to um, very detailed information in the crash data set. Um, as a researcher, I can tell you, um, who, someone who has worked with data on a variety of projects in a variety of fields, this is the best data set that I've ever worked with. It's very, very clean and, cons and uh, consistently collected each year. Um, so there's a lot of uh, possibilities and things to look at that um, we, we think can kind of get at the causes of crashes, and that's the goal. Uh, by us presenting, the goal of us presenting this information in a visual format, which we find is kind of the most effective. I think I've been in meetings where people throw numbers around um, about uh, people that were uh, killed or injured um, in alcohol-impaired um, collisions. And when you're throwing numbers around, 
people don't always kind of um, digest that information or process it in a way that it seems like a big deal. But when you see things visually, they seem to react more and uh, sometimes it is more likely to move them into action. So that's kind of the goal and with the hopes that the practitioners, uh, practitioners uh, many of whom are local uh, government officials, and they have limited resources anyway. So the goal is that they can then focus their efforts on actually developing and implementing the, the programs that might actually impact these types of behaviors. So uh, I, I know you guys have all probably uh, data-driven approaches to addressing public policy issues um, has kind of you know been around for a long time. I think that uh, in this on this project in particular, um, we are very fortunate that we're able to truly have um, and develop even uh, better data-driven approaches over time because we have access to such great data sets and because the partners are very willing to make alterations to their data sets that would allow linkages between the data sets. And as I mentioned, the state police, they um, are they're basically the owners of the, the crash data. It's the centralized location where all of the crashes around the state use ARIES, which is our it's automated reporting information exchange system. And they're um, they're reporting electronically and uh, when they do this, it goes into the centralized data system maintained by the Indiana State Police. Um, we also have uh, a data agreement with the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. They give us licensed drivers, registered vehicles, and citations, which are used for normalizing the crash data and providing context. Um, but they also, more recently, have given us access to driver history and I'll give a little bit more detail about that later on as well, but that um, has been a really great development because we're able to send them the information about drivers and crashes each year when we receive the data, and then they will send us the driver history back on those drivers and crashes, and we're able to see um, whether a, a large portion of drivers that were in collisions that were speed related have a history of speeding violations and things like that. Uh, we also get information and, and data from the DOT and uh, we have an electronic citation system that's maintained by the Indiana Supreme Court that we have access to. So there's a number of data sets that are very useful in our work beyond the, just the crash data. Uh, so the ARIES crash database, like I said, is maintained in, uh, by the Indiana State Police. Um, they do have it managed by a private contractor, APRIS, which I think is um, similar to what is um, being developed here. Um, I know that uh, Nicole and uh, the roadway safety team, um, that they have developed a new interface. Um, that. And then I think APRIS will be take, taking over kind of the management of that. Um, we've had this partnership with APRIS probably for about 10 years, but it was actually a group of individuals that kind of developed a local interface in Indiana that was then bought out by APRIS. So it um, seems pretty similar to kind of what, what process is going on here in Minnesota. And we do have a state law in Indiana that mandates that local agencies report which I think is a good thing because um, if they're not, we have the state law that mandates crash reporting. We don't have a, um, a law or a mandate on things such as crime reporting. So what happens is all of the local agencies kind of use their own system and, um, and then the data is collected more inconsistently and it's kind of hard, harder to merge the data sets. So. This is just kind of a picture. I know, I know it's difficult, but I just, on the left, just real quick, I just wanted you to see that, that that was the prior paper version of the crash report that we used to use. And we came on about 11 years ago. And um, over time, they've gotten to the point where um, nearly all of the agencies in Indiana, if not all of them, are now reporting using the electronic reporting system. And so that has, evolved into what you see on the right, which was just a diagram of the relational database. Um, we get about 4 million records annually. 
the database has over 200 uh, variables in it that we can look at, and uh, it's just it's it's just a very rich database. So our research process is each year we get in the spring of each year we'll get an extract from the Indiana State Police or APRIS, and um, we it goes to our partners in biostatistics. They'll import that into uh, a SQL database that we have, and that allows our analysts to kind of easily query the data. And because it's such a complex database, we need a tool like that that we can select the data that we need instead of always working with these very large data files. Um, we also have, um, we create specialized functions in the database. Um, sometimes we might want to combine maybe two or three variables and, and get at um, uh, something more specific. And um, one of the variables that we created is the census locale because the crash, uh, or the crash report only allows officers to pick urban or rural. And a lot of the local partners said that that doesn't really fit because most of the areas in their county might be more suburban. So we created, uh, we used GIS to create buffers around the census urban areas and we tag each of our crashes um, as urban, suburban, exurban, or rural. So that's just one example of one of the specialized functions that we've created um, within the database. Uh, so once our research team starts querying and analyzing the data, um, everyone's kind of assigned different uh, topics to cover, but then we create a set of data visualizations that I'm going to start showing you now um, that we think, um, again, the visual representation of the data is what really has more of an impact on people. And um, we're able to present that information at formal presentations in public, in our reports. We've done infographics for community partners that have asked us to for specific things. Maybe they have a public awareness campaign and they, they want um, a specialized info, infographic for that campaign. Um, and so the goal is to help with that and also to help law enforcement make sure they have the information they need when they're planning these targeted enforcement campaigns. And then sometimes they need to apply for funding um, to support those campaigns. And a lot of times those funding applications will require some of the information that we're providing to them. The reports that we produce regularly each year, um, just real quick, we have some fact sheets that are, again, follow the NHTSA guidelines. Um, that's alcohol or impaired driving, um, child passenger safety, uh, dangerous driving. I'll, I'll come back to that just in a second. Non-motorists, which is the bicyclists and pedestrians. We also have animal-drawn vehicle operators. Um, those numbers are pretty small generally, but we do have a couple of areas in Indiana that still have a fairly large Amish population. So um, we do occasionally get requests for information on, uh, on uh, animal-drawn vehicle operators and crashes. Um, motorcycles, occupant protection or seatbelt usage, and uh, trucks, which is basically commercial vehicles or the large, large trucks, um, and then young drivers. Um, the county municipality book that we do each year is something, Indiana has 92 counties, and we have a section at the front of that book that actually um, has a series of maps and tables where counties can compare themselves to other counties with rates of impaired driving or seatbelt usage or motorcycle crashes. And then beyond that, each county will have a two-page summary of the numbers specific to their county by municipality within their county. And again, the goal is to inform uh, public policy um, and changes to policy and programs um, through, this, through this research. And our results are, are presented to a variety of groups, and some of those are, were some of the groups that I mentioned earlier, um, and representatives, some of the committees that are representatives from some of the groups um, that I mentioned earlier uh, from state and local agencies primarily. So now I'm going to get into some of, the, hopefully, the fun stuff where you can see some of the data visualizations and see um, the types of things that we're able to visualize with, with this uh, really complicated data set. So um, this first chart here is something that I think probably most people know because um, it's because 
we know that young males have higher insurance rates um, than just than anybody else usually. So um, this is kind of um, intuitive, but uh, if you look at this, it's this chart shows five years a five year trend for male and female drivers by age group, and that's engaged in dangerous driving behavior. I mentioned that earlier. We have a special definition for dangerous driving that's specific to Indiana law. Um, it involves speeding, um, something that is aggressive driving, would be dis uh, reckless driving, disregarding a signal. So, um, but you can see clearly across all five years, um, the higher percentage of drivers involved in those types of behaviors are the young males um, under the age of 34 and usually really even under the age of 25 is, is where it's primarily focused. Um, young female drivers are also more likely to um, be engaged in dangerous driving behavior so it does seem to decrease with age and probably experience of the driver but this is a pattern that we see consistently year after year so. Uh, this, this chart is something that um, I, th I think the NHTSA reports that they put out annually include something similar to this but what we're seeing, and I know um, I, I uh, spoke with Frank yesterday, who I think gave the last uh, presentation about kind of um, perceptions of enforced speeding um, or automated speeding enforcement. Um, I think that some behaviors like that maybe are still kind of not viewed as that big of a problem. I think mostly um, most states have done a pretty good job of making seatbelt use um, perceived as being very important. It's not something that a lot of people ignore anymore. So if you see the top line, the overall seatbelt usage rate in collisions in Indiana consistently has been very high. It's over 90% typically in crashes. And I think if you look at seatbelt surveys in Indiana, which are all individuals, not just those in crashes, it's even higher than that, closer to 94, 95%. So, but the bottom line illustrates the seatbelt usage amongst people who were killed in collisions. And you can see consistently that those numbers tend to be below 50%. So it illustrates um, that you're much more likely to die in a crash if you're not wearing the seatbelt. So. This table is a little complicated, but I think it, it, um, it shows something really important because I think it illustrates how numbers, um, sometimes small numbers, um, whenever you just look at the numbers themselves, seem like they don't mean that much. Um, but this is, the table shows um, the, different, uh, the four different passenger vehicle types that we look at, which is passenger cars, uh, pickup trucks, SUVs, and vans. Um, and when you look at the top half of the table shows you those in crashes who were restrained or wearing seat belts and it tells you um, their injury type. And then the bottom half shows you people in crashes who were not restrained or were not wearing a seat belt by their injury type. If you just look at the straight numbers, um, it looks like 0.1% of people who were wearing seat belts were killed in, in collisions, which is a very small number. And, but only 1% of people who were not wearing a seatbelt were killed. Again, it looks like a very small number. But if you look at the overall number, um, the overall number of people killed in both groups um, is very close, 189 to 195. But look at the number on the top. The total number we're looking at of, in restrained is over 200,000. And then the bottom number, um, is only 19,000. So um, the number there on the bottom is what we use is we calculate relative risk of a, of a fatal injury in a crash. And it shows that if you're not wearing a seatbelt in a passenger car in a collision, that you are 10 times more likely to die in that crash than if you were wearing a seatbelt. So the relative risk number actually kind of is a more powerful message than just kind of looking at the raw numbers. Um, you can also see, for example, um, pickup trucks, you're 14 times more likely to die in a crash if you're not wearing a seatbelt. 
So this, I, I mentioned earlier, the census locale variable that we created um, and that we use frequently now in, in our analyses, and it's a visual depiction of that. Um, if you look, uh, it's, it's not surprising that there are more crashes and more people injured in crashes in more highly densely um, or densely populated areas, urban areas. So um, the, uh, the bottom left pie there shows you that 41% uh, I think of, of all uh, passenger vehicle occupants who were killed in crashes were located in urban areas. Um, and I think it's the number of rural is 19%. 19% of all individuals killed were killed in rural areas. So it kind of looks like the bigger portion is in urban areas. Um, but if you look at the top bars, that shows you the rate of fatalities um, per 1,000 individuals involved in those areas. And it kind of accounts for the population density or the lower populations in the rural areas. And you can see that the actual fatality rates are much higher in rural areas than they are in the urban areas, even though the numbers are larger in the urban areas. And this, this is one, uh, a, a graphic that we use frequently. It is, um, if, if you're not familiar with this kind of graphic, it, it's a little um, tough to interpret until you get used to it, but I think it's also pretty powerful. The inner pie is actually showing you um, passenger vehicle occupants in crashes by um, the percent, by locale, and you can see um, close to 80% of all passenger vehicle occupants in collisions, and this is not uh, talking about killed, this is, um, or injury type, it's just overall, um, is nearly 80% in urban areas, only 6% in rural areas. Um, however, um, if you, the outer pie is showing you the percent restrained or the percent wearing uh, seat belts. And what we've found in our analysis um, is that the further you get away from the city, the lower the seatbelt usage rate is. And the graphic that I showed you previously showed that the fatality rates are much higher in the rural areas. So we know that that's one contributing factor. Um, there's also other factors that affect that, of course, um, such as just um, the distance from a trauma center um, or getting emergency vehicles out to help someone that's been involved in a crash. Uh, this is where kind of the public policy aspect comes in. Um, this is an example of something um, where you've actually seen change due to a change in public policy and you've seen the numbers change in crashes and the numbers um, of, uh, specifically of seatbelt usage. So in Indiana, prior to 2007, um, the seatbelt law um, excluded pickup trucks and it excluded SUVs. That, the people in those types of vehicles were not required to wear seat belts. Um, and when Indiana adopted the primary um, seat belt enforcement law, they, um, they decided to include all passenger vehicles, including pickup trucks. If you look, the red line there is prior to the law. And you can see that in crashes prior to that law, only 54% of pickup truck occupants were wearing seat belts in crashes. Immediately after passing that law, we started to see dramatic increases in seat belt usage amongst pickup truck um, occupants. And in the most recent um, numbers that are available, um, it's, it's up to 83% seat belt usage in pickup trucks, and the 95% um, was for the passenger cars. This is something that's interesting because um, we haven't really totally um, figured out why this happens, um, but these, this is a map of Indiana by county, and these maps are showing rates of different things and different characteristics of crashes. So there are some things that we know that are just kind of common sense. If I showed you a map of deer-involved collisions in Indiana, geographically, obviously, you would see more deer collisions in the far northern parts of the state and the southern parts of the state that have more forested areas and kind of less developed areas. And you see that consistently. The same thing with motorcycles because we know that motorcyclists like to go to areas that 
um, where there are more parks, more trees, and um, you know, just more scenic areas. So we see more motorcycle collisions in those areas. These are a little bit harder to understand because these are direct um, behaviors of people involved in crashes. And if you look at the left map, that illustrates um, the percent of speeding collisions or collisions that involved a driver who was speeding by county. And the, top, the dark gray and the red counties are those that fell above the median um, rate for speeding collisions. And you can see they're all clustered in the northern parts of the state with a few exceptions down to the south. Um, the map on the right, on the other hand, shows the seatbelt usage rate uh, in collisions for occupants in collisions by county. And in that instance, you see clusters of individuals not wearing seatbelts in crashes in the southern part of the state. So it's, it's something that law enforcement um, has used this information to figure out um, which counties need more targeted campaigns to try to, to try to change behavior. But obviously the people in southern Indiana don't like to be told to wear a seatbelt, and the people in northern Indiana don't like to be told how fast they can drive. <laughs> so, um, so, but it, it is helpful. It's also helpful for the funding agencies who, whenever they have funding available to address a particular topic, like increase a, a goal of increasing seatbelt usage, they're able to kind of target the counties that they think have the biggest problems. So young drivers is always um, kind of a, a big issue and a hot topic, I think, in most states. And um, Indiana is no exception. So this is something that we also see consistently from year to year. This graphic shows uh, the rate per 10,000 licensed drivers by age group of involvement in crashes. And young drivers consistently, year after year, uh, are the, are, have a much higher rate, um, usually uh, 24 and under. Um, of being involved in crashes than others. Uh, this is probably going to be a little hard to interpret, but this is another example of where policy did kind of affect some change and where we actually see change in behavior and a change in uh, the characteristics of crashes. So uh, a few years ago, Indiana um, adopted a, the, a graduated driver's license law and which of course put restrictions on, on drivers, on passengers that they could have in vehicles, um, curfews of when they can be out on the roads, and things like that. And um, after that law, it was implemented over um, several phases. So the first part of the chart that you're looking at shows you the numbers of um, young drivers involved in crashes 2007, 2008 to 2009. And you can see that the average um, for each quarter was higher when you move to the next phase of the first phase of implementation of the GDL law. Um, you can see that those young driver involvement in crashes begins to drop. And then once the final phase was implemented, we saw an even bigger drop of young drivers involved in crashes. And um, I think just uh, what we've seen is um, that's a, it's a positive change. We've seen like more supervision and more experience has helped. What we have also seen though is that um, a lot of times that just kind of shifts to maybe the, you know, the age group that is just beyond the, the GDL. So maybe, um, you know, that we've seen some small increases in numbers and crashes for like the 20 and 21 year old age group. Those that are kind of, um, maybe they, uh, had their license before GDL was implemented. And um, so those numbers or the proportions of those numbers kind of went up after that. Okay, I, I'm just going to go through um, just a few things. This is kind of the final um, uh, area that I wanted to address. But I, I, the data visualizations that I've shown are kind of, they're typical. They're things that we do across all topical areas. But there are things that we, we tried to um, develop some different approaches and different ways of linking data that has proven useful over the last several years. So I'm just going to go through a few examples of that. So one thing that we've done, um, and again, this is, I, I think this has been, um, you know, it's been done elsewhere. Um, we've, we've wanted 
we've done this primarily in Marion County. Um, the Marion County Traffic Safety Partnership, each year they're responsible for um, identifying areas for uh, plant, planning sobriety checkpoints and uh, identifying areas or locations that would be best suited for sobriety checkpoints and where those would be most effective. So uh, several years ago, they um, approached us and our team about um, helping them to do that and using spatial analysis and the um, kernel density estimation method in ArcGIS, um, we were able to identify clusters of impaired driving collisions in Marion County and uh, identify um, pockets of areas within Marion County and the boundaries and the street, the primary streets that those encompass um, for that it would be ideal for them to um, plan sobriety checkpoints. And this approach, it, it, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's complicated, but what we do is we divide Marion County up into these very, very tiny small grid, grid cells. Um, they're point, point 0.1 mile, and then uh, we do a one mile search radius around those, and we start to assign weights to each grid cell based on um, the collisions those that have more um, impaired driving collisions get assigned a higher weight. So the map that I'm getting ready to show you, you'll be able to see um, what I'm talking about. So I know you can't read a lot of the um, information on the map, but so the green areas are those with the, the grid cells with the lower weights assigned to them. Um, and then the white areas are those with, with a zero weight assigned to them. And then it moves up to the uh, orange and red areas, which have the higher weights. And so you can see where those clusters are forming of the higher um, rates of impaired driving crashes. And what we did was we went and overlaid the street file and were able to kind of identify the street boundaries that generally follow those cluster areas. And on the left, I've just kind of given some brief descriptions of the clusters and the, the uh, communities. Um, the first one is located in Castleton, which is kind of the northern part of Indianapolis, and it gives the specific streets. And this is the information that was provided to the partnership where they are able to kind of determine within those cluster areas and those streets that we've identified where they wanted to um, plan sobriety checkpoints. Uh, this is another example of um, something that uh, wasn't possible. I, I had mentioned this earlier. It uh, wasn't possible previously, but because of that kind of collaboration with the agencies that are, have been willing to share data, we've been able to get at more specifics um, on an, a number of uh, crash characteristics. So when we got the driver history data from the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, um, what they gave us was information on how frequently, if someone had suspended license, if they received citations, and that would be anything from speeding to not wearing a seat belt. Um, it could be impaired driving. Um, and and uh, they actually had a, a classification um, in, in the data that they provided of habitual traffic offenders who have maybe had multiple citations for um, a variety of dangerous driving behaviors. And um, the chart shows you that um, if you look between this time period, this, this was something that was done by a team member of mine several years ago, but if you look um, during this time period, pretty consistently each year, 36 to 37 percent of drivers in crashes have prior offenses um, through BMV where they've been cited for a number of behaviors. And amongst those, we found that speeding, restraint use, and hit and run were um, the most frequent um, prior offenses. Drivers between the ages of 21 and 24 were most likely uh, to have prior offenses. And again, the male drivers were more likely than female drivers to have the risky driving or dangerous driving behaviors and, and to be cited for that. 18% um, of all drivers, uh, or I'm sorry, of alcohol impaired drivers had two or more prior um, OWI or DUI offenses on their record. So you're seeing 
those individuals that have prior offenses in that are, are going out and getting in crashes. And this is I, uh, probably, again, a little difficult to see, but um, just to illustrate kind of the difference in the, by age and by gender, um, the, top, uh, the top left chart is speeding prior offenses, and that's the driver history again. And this is uh, for drivers and crashes. The top right is a, the aggressive driving um, per the Indiana law definition. The bottom left is seat belt priors. And then the bottom right is OWI or DUI priors. And you can see so the red line is males, um, the blue line is females, and then you can see the ages across the bottom. So across both males and females, the younger age groups are more likely to have prior offenses. And then again, the males um, are much higher rates of prior offenses than females. Uh, another thing that we're doing that's kind of, um, it's new for us, is that um, we've been listening to our partners who specifically say that they want more local information. And I think to everyone, you know, public policy is local and you, you're more concerned with what's happening to your kid and your community. And a lot of times that information is not readily available. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're trying to create custom dashboards that are going to be made, made available um, online um, and we're, we're just now kind of in the exploratory stage on this but we're looking at different jurisdictions so um, we're doing things by Indiana State Police Districts because there are I think maybe eight or nine regions throughout the state each police district covers seven or eight counties something like that um, we're there we have local law enforcement liaisons um, and they have regions that they cover of course we're going to do things at the county level um, and then we've had some legislators talk about that they would like to see this type of information for their legislative districts as well. Um, and then uh, municipal police have their own jurisdictions. So we're, um, we're kind of anxious to get into this. We've, um, we've done a few test dashboards and um, shown them to different groups and they've been impressed by those. So um, we'll, that's something that will probably um, become a lot more visible um, as one of our deliverables each year over the next um, year or so. And finally, this is um, because uh, I, we've had such a focus on bicyclists and um, pedestrians, um, especially in Marion County, which is the core county in Indianapolis, um, we are starting to look at ways of addressing some um, deficiencies in the data that's available to look at this issue. And um, Indiana's a little, is, is probably more than a little behind Minnesota in this area um, as far as developing infrastructure for alternate modes of uh, transportation, um, such as walking and bicycling. But over the last, um, you know, 10 to 15 years, there's been a significant investment in doing that in communities around the state. Um, so this map actually shows you in Marion County in Indianapolis, which is um, one of the main counties that has invested um, most significantly in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, between 2005 and 2015, you can see um, the number of bicyclists involved in crashes has, has grown pretty significantly. And um, we can start to see the clusters of where that's happening. Um, in Marion County, they've also invested in bicycle lanes on the roadways. So bicyclists are actually, they have their designated lane, but they're sharing it with motor vehicles. And uh, so what we're trying to do is gather the geographic, the space, uh, sorry, the shape files so that we can um, overlay some of the trail and um, uh, bicycle path information um, with the crashes and analyze crash characteristics that way. Um, but one of the problems with that is that we, everybody always wants to know, well, how many bicyclists are on the road? How many pedestrians are actually out there? And that data is not um, readily available. So we are now um, planning um, a project with Dr. Greg Lindsay, who's actually here today, um, to uh, replicate some of the methods that he has used in Minnesota and in, in Minneapolis um, to measure bicyclist risk 
of injury in, in crashes. And that's um, part of that involves um, gathering uh, information on bicycle counts and um, during peak times and then estimating um, numbers. I, I, earlier I mentioned that uh, you know we're normalizing by population or vehicle miles travel and things like that. That's just not going to work with um, bicyclists and pedestrians. So we need this this information in order to effectively measure risk. Uh, so, yeah. So that study um, really it's it's uh, we're, we're, it's going to involve a lot of student activities um, as well. Um, if it, um, once we get it going, and we've had a lot of students that. Um, have uh, internships with local partners who have in, who have expressed an interest in gathering this information, and I think um, this is one of those collaborative efforts where if you can see something that works in another place from an applied research uh, perspective, you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. It's it's good to try that approach and and see if it can be effective where you are as well. Okay, so in conclusion, I just uh, I think that the overall um, message of, of what we're seeing is we've seen so much improvement, but we know that we're not there yet. So um, I've been amazed just since I've started doing this, which has been, again, 10 or 11 years, at the improvements that we've seen in the crash data itself. Um, when we first started, we didn't have lat long information, which would allow us to do spatial analysis. Um, we, a lot of times, we had to do the geocoding ourselves. Um, now that's kind of embedded into the crash reporting system. Um, they have their click and point on their map that automatically assigns that information. So we've seen those improvements. We've also seen improvements in, uh, in the linkages between data sets. Um, and I've been in talks with people who are talking about doing things like um, assigning a, a bracelet to someone who's transported from the scene to the hospital um, that has a barcode on it so that we can more effectively track um, individuals and their injuries um, throughout the process um, through other data sets that may not be, um, you know, linked together right now. So those are things that are kind of in the works. Some of them will probably proceed, and some of them I'm sure will hit roadblocks, but um, it's good to see. Um, but one of the things that I think definitely needs more work is I, I've illustrated kind of these consistent patterns that we see, like, for example, with young male drivers or in, in Indiana, those geographic areas that consistently don't wear their seat belts or they're speeding while they're driving um, is, is to look at um, more targeted approaches and, and I guess new approaches, innovative approaches to addressing that problem because if we're seeing those consistent patterns year after year, then it kind of tells you that the, that the um, approaches to addressing those problems could use some improvement. So um, my hope is that, um, that that will be kind of the next phase um, in this partnership in Indiana is that we will, you know, be moving towards actions to um, actually see changes in some of these behaviors. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions here? Oh, good. Lots of questions are good. Uh, and here's a question, uh, just uh, in the uh, driver history of prior, uh, prior offenses in, in that chart, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you said that uh, young drivers tend to uh, behave the traffic offenser. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the question is uh, why the, um, there's a peak uh, in the tw uh, age of 21 to 24, but mm -hmm. not in, uh, uh, in the age of uh, 60 to 20? Yeah. yeah. Uh, specifically in that, that's actually a good, a good question, but probably what you're seeing there is just the fact that um, the younger drivers don't have a driving history because they just got their licenses. So the 15, 16, 17-year-olds, um, they may have higher rates than overall, but because they've been driving for less time, they may not be as likely to have priors as the 20 to 21 to 24 year olds. Um, is, is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank okay. you. Uh -huh. So my question was similar. I was curious why as drivers got older, 
their probability of having a prior offense didn't increase. Yeah, um, I think, um, so usually with more experience, I think uh, drivers um, overall tend to become safer. Um, they tend to be a little more cautious and, and be more familiar with um, the laws and things like that. However, if you would, were to dig deeper, um, even at the, those older age groups, what we found in the driver history information is you are going to find some drivers that are those habitual traffic offenders. So they may be in the older age groups, but if you go back, they've been, you know, exhibiting this kind of behavior over time and they're not, they're not really learning. You know, I think as drivers get older and they get tickets or they get cited or they're in crashes, um, they, you kind of learn from those mistakes and you change your behavior. Um, I, and, but there are definitely individuals that are habitual traffic offenders in the older age group. So. so I'm going to keep it right along the line okay. of this. I guess what I was wondering is, um, were those looking at in the last, say, five, ten years, are, mm. are the records being expunged? That's, you know, because you would think there would be a cohort issue that something about today's 20 year olds have more traffic offenses but I was thinking by the time you reach 40 you may not have any in the last five years but the 20 year olds have them in the last five years. Right so what yeah and what what we're looking at what we get and, and it is um, that's a good point but what we get is actually um, we have gotten data that is three years prior and then we've also gotten data that's five years prior, so okay. we're not going all the all the way back. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a good point. I guess that kind of gets better at what you're talking about. We're not looking at driver history for 20 years, for example. We're just trying to look at their driver history for the more recent periods. But the overall numbers, if you're looking at a three to five year period, tend to be higher for the younger age group. So. Um, so this is getting like really deep in the data, okay. and I'm not sure how, how much insight, but you know, MUC keeps expanding. So for, for everyone in the audience, MUC is the model minimum uniform crash criteria, and so that's set by the federal um, standards, and they keep asking more and more and more of law enforcement officers mm -hmm. to document, um, and we can get more intelligent on the interface side to try to make it easier and, and seem less um, sort of laborious, mm -hmm. um, but do you have any sense if if an officer has too many questions or too many options that they tend to default to maybe the first, um, you know, the first thing in the list. So, you know, you kind of have this tyranny of, of choice. And so if you have a drop down list with 50 items, they're just gonna pick the first one rather than take the time to look through right. all of the things in that drop down list. Um, actually, yes. And I, I think um, I, I spoke with you a little bit about this earlier, but I, um, I think, um, there's more detail to be offered. Some of the fields in the crash database, we as analysts can see the data is not as clean. And one of the areas is like the primary factor or the event fields. And because there are so many different categories for officers to choose from, and they also have a lot of options that involve other, um, I think, uh, and, and also some of the categories are not clearly defined, some of the wording, those are areas that have been identified as needed for improvement. Um, some of the wording of those categories is not clear exactly what they mean. So when an officer's in a hurry and they're filling out a crash report, if they don't understand what something is, they're not going to select it. And if they don't see something that jumps out at them that is a perfect fit and they have an other option, a lot of times they click, click other. So that's kind of valuable information that's being lost. Um, and so th those are some of the variables that we're looking to improve. Yeah. I think we're ready. A very quick question. Um, it's not a great question. Okay. <laughs> you can ask the question afterwards. Uh, yeah. well, How's that? Uh, so. uh, we're running out of time. I just quickly wanted to say that uh, Thank you. Join me in thanking our speaker uh, uh, for her very interesting talk. We could talk about crash data for uh, for days, actually. You know, one solution is take all 20 to 25-year-old males off the road, and we would have a lot less problems. So um, anyway, we've had, uh, you know, four different speakers now dealing with crash databases, rail safety, 
speeding law, systemic approaches to safety. Next week, we have a very interesting talk uh, by Professor Juliana Abel on wearable technologies and smart materials, applications for transportation and safety. Uh, please uh, join us again next week, same time, same place. And those students uh, taking the course for credit should be picking up uh, their reports uh, from uh, Kylie Bivens in the back after the talk. Any questions regarding the class? You can see me afterwards. I'm more than happy to discuss any issues. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place.